All right, good morning, everyone. I'm going to just give it a couple more minutes. Um, looks like we still have some people trying to log in. Um, but just some housekeeping. Um, I do have everyone uh, muted, um, and you should not be sharing your screen at all. Um, you guys will have options down at the bottom of your screen uh, that show if you want to have your um, microphone on or your video. If you could please just make sure um, on your end that they are muted. Um, they should have a little red line going across. Um, that'll make it a lot easier so we don't hear everyone's background and we can have some better audio coming through. Um, and also video quality. Um, I'm streaming here at my home on my Wi-Fi, so I'm hoping that the video quality will be um, pretty good for you guys to see everything. Um, in the past, I've attended webinars um, that sometimes will freeze and might have some issues. The best way to get through that is just to log out and log back in. Um, so that's that's my best advice for you if you're if you're not having good water or uh, video quality. Um, I mentioned earlier there's a chat box down there. Um, ideally, this should be a pretty interactive webinar. I'm hoping um, I can see you guys. If you have questions, you can type them in. Um, I'll try to answer them as I go along. Uh, but if not, I'm going to leave some time at the end of the webinar to answer some of your questions. Um, and I'll also provide my contact information if you guys want to chat anytime after this webinar. Uh, the rain barrels are, we have them, and we are just waiting for a date that seems like it would be safe for everyone to receive their rain barrels. Um, so anyone that did purchase their rain barrel, um, we're just going to send you an email when we get that date uh, settled down. We'll let you know any of the instructions. Uh, most likely you'll be coming to the Conservation District office to pick them up in our parking lot, um, but we will be able to let you know as soon as we know what's kind of going on uh, when that's going to be. Um, additionally, the slides and the resources are going to be available to download after this presentation. So uh, don't don't feel like you need to you know copy everything down. Take a lot of notes. Um, you're more than welcome to. Um, but I will have this hopefully by early next week. I will have the PowerPoint presentation um, and hopefully also the recording of this webinar available on our website. So you can always reference that afterwards. Um, and also at the end of this webinar, we're going to uh, send you an email shortly after, um, just asking you guys to fill out a survey. Um, this is actually funded through the Department of Environmental Protection's Environmental Education Grant. Um, and if you fill out a survey, it just helps us uh, get future funding from them to do similar educational projects like this one. So without further ado, uh, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Brittany Hartzell. I'm the Watershed Specialist at the Columbia County Conservation District. Um, and I also work very closely with the Columbia Montour Coalition for Source Water Protection. Um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about them so you guys can kind of get a feel um, about what we do and the resources that are out there. So, Columbia Montour Coalition for Source Water Protection, uh, we are working to get drinking water protection um, incorporated into land use planning farming, industrial practices, and municipal decisions. Um, and we also are out there trying to educate citizens um, to make, you know, day-to-day -day choices that are uh, for the benefit of water quality. Uh, we hold regular uh, meetings quarterly, and we also work with stakeholders and reach out to the community um, between the two counties to do some more educational projects like this. Um, I would love if you guys considered uh, joining and attending some of the meetings in the future. Uh, we do a bunch of activities similar to this one, and we have a whole series uh, called Good Water Equals Good Life, um, where we talk about good water and how that can be incorporated in your life. Um, so the next part here is uh, the Conservation District. Um, that's where I work. Uh, we provide a number of technical assistance services, um, including watershed protection and education, um, which is what I do. But we also offer erosion and sedimentation control and permitting. We do agricultural assistance. And then for the townships, we also offer a dirt, gravel, and low-volume roads program. Um, so if you have any concerns about those types of topics, uh, please reach out to us. Um, we are always here to assist you, or we can get you in contact with other agencies that can also help you. Um, so of course, check out our website sometime if you haven't got the chance yet. Uh, there's lots of good resources on there. 
And again, this uh, is funded by the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection Environmental Education Grant. Uh, we received this, so we were able to purchase rain barrels, and we were also able to put on this webinar for you guys. Um, luckily, we were able to switch it over to a webinar. Originally, it was a workshop, um, but it's all working out. And again, if you guys were able to fill out that survey for us at the end, that'll help us qualify for future grants uh, similar to this one to do similar projects. So for today's agenda, um, we're going to talk about mostly rain barrels. And I'm going to start off talking very, very briefly about uh, watersheds and stormwater and pollution within our watersheds. Um, all three of those topics, we could do a whole series of webinars. Um, so it's just going to be a very brief overview. Um, but the overall concept is that we all live downstream from someone else. So as a community, um, there are different things that we can do to work together to make sure that our water supply um, is clean for ourselves and also just the wildlife and, and uh, everything else that benefits from it. Uh, we're going to talk about rain barrels, of course, uh, the benefits and uses of rain barrels and how they work, how you can use them in your backyard. Um, and then we're going to get into the nitty gritty and talk about some design and construction of rain barrels, how to do that, um, and we're actually going to give you instructions so you can do that at home. Or if you purchase a rain barrel through us, um, we give you all of the uh, materials that you would need and you just simply take it home and install it. Um, there's also a way to calculate how much storm water is coming off of your property. Um, so you can see how many rain barrels you would need um, to collect all that storm water. Um, another, probably the biggest part after you get it um, installed is going to be maintenance and additional tips for you guys. Um, just how to deal with your rain barrel throughout the year as you, as you use it over the years and what to do with that. Um, and also just, you know, there's a lot of concerns about things like mosquitoes. Um, we will definitely go over um, things like that. And at the end, I'll cover uh, some of the instructions for picking up rain barrels um, at the conservation district. So uh, we're going to start off talking about watersheds. So watersheds are an area of land where precipitation collects um, and it drains into a single point. So basically what that means is that and you can think of it as a bathtub. So when you take a shower, the water goes everywhere, um, but ultimately it drains into a single location. So think of your watershed as that. And the tops of your bathtub are like the mountains. So you can think of the Susquehanna Valley as a big bathtub. Uh, we all live in a watershed. There's different watersheds everywhere. Again, they're pretty much delineated based off of um, mountains and higher elevations and where one drop of rain, where it flows, um, determines what a watershed is. And everyone lives downstream from a watershed. So what you do affects everyone downstream from you um, and vice versa. What your neighbor does upstream from you affects you. Um, so that's something we're always trying to teach people and really just kind of keep in mind. Uh, Pennsylvania in particular is a water state. We have a ton of water. In fact, we have 86,000 miles of stream here in Pennsylvania. That is actually second only to Alaska. So we have a lot of water to deal with uh, to begin with. Um, and there's certain things that we can do to kind of uh, reduce that uh, issue that water can create. Um, and of course, we're also uh, not dealing with drought. So it is kind of a benefit. We have a lot of water. But of course, you have um, the other issues that come along with that such as um, pollution and flooding and those kind of issues. Um, water that lands here truly does end up going to the ocean eventually. Um, so we live here in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So if you look at that Pennsylvania map, the light green area is the Chesapeake Bay watershed. There's a couple of watersheds here in Pennsylvania, but this one is the biggest. Um, ultimately, it all drains into the Susquehanna, which goes to the Chesapeake Bay, and then uh, that water eventually goes into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, if that water doesn't, it's probably evaporated and it just continues the water cycle. So I have here a map um, of Montour County and Columbia County um, looking at all the streams in our county. Um, so you can see that in Columbia County, uh, where all of the different watersheds are, uh, the different colors show you the different watersheds. And within them, you have the streams and the little tributaries that lead to the Susquehanna River. Um, so you can see that the blue ones, they're labeled as attaining, and that just means that it's good water quality. 
Um, and the red ones are non-attaining, and that just means that it's impaired or there's some sort of pollution issue going on in there um, that needs to be cleaned up. Um, and it just means that it's more difficult for aquatic life to survive in areas like that. Um, Montour County also certainly has a ton of streams as well. Um, I didn't have the data on attaining versus non-attaining, uh, but you can see that they have a lot of streams. The majority of them, unfortunately, are impaired streams, uh, but the conservation district over there does a ton of really great work um, to clean those up. So hopefully they can get those uh, redesignated uh, re as cleaner waters. Um, but of course, there's, there's a lot of work to be done in both counties, um, and rain barrels are one thing that can help us out um, with that issue. If you live by a red stream, um, especially in Columbia County, um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, we offer stabilization or stream size buffers, um, habitat, we can do wetlands. Um, so I'd love to hear from you if you live by a red stream. Um, we potentially could look for some grants or assistance to see if we can uh, get any projects done on your property, or at least we could give you some recommendations. And on that note, um, there's a number of watershed organizations out there uh, by watersheds that are doing a ton of really great work. Um, so if you want to identify where you're located, uh, I do encourage you guys to check out your local watershed group. Um, lots of them do presentations and educational activities like this. Um, occasionally, there's some opportunities to volunteer and actually get out there to uh, help uh, do some conservation on the ground. Uh, their websites can be found at our Conservation District website at ColumbiaCCD.org if you're interested in joining at all or even just attending one meeting to see what it's like. Uh, I highly encourage that. So stormwater. Uh, stormwater is rainfall that uh, flows over the ground surface. So it's, it's water that doesn't get infiltrated into the soil as it naturally would. Um, and of course, because it's not infiltrated into the soil, which would be ideal, um, it reaches the stream. And as you get too much stormwater, uh, you, of course, can cause flash floods eventually. So we're all very familiar with stormwater around here. Um, so this is rain barrels are one thing that you can do to reduce stormwater and the effects of stormwater. So um, basically, it's created when you introduce water um, to an impervious service uh, within the watershed. And that can include you know, roads, driveways, parking lots, rooftops, sidewalks. Um, all of those things are not going to uh, collect water or store water. It's just going to run right off, right into the streets, into our gutters, into our streams. Um, and that's how we can create some problems. Um, in a natural system, runoff is pretty minimal. It does happen. Uh, but if you have some healthy soil, um, that should be able to absorb it up, especially if you have a lot of vegetative covers like trees and plants, or if you have a healthy wetland and, and floodplain, um, they help store a ton of water. Um, so typically it would be minimal, but as we develop and build houses and uh, businesses, we tend to see a lot more stormwater coming from that. If you look at the top left photo here, um, you can see that it begins with a bunch of vegetation. You have very minimal runoff. In this example, it's 10%. Um, and as you remove trees and grasses, uh, you get to 20%, 30%, 50%. Um, so as we develop and remove trees and remove grasses, um, and we don't have as healthy as soils to infiltrate that, um, or even trees to capture that in their leaves, uh, we end up getting more and more storm water. Um, so I can't emphasize enough the importance of plants in the landscape for uh, dealing with stormwater. So you, know, you guys don't have to do this right here, um, but just an example of figuring out how much runoff your property might be generating. Um, in general, one inch of rain uh, yields 0.6 gallons of water per square foot. So just as an example, if you have a thousand square feet, um, of impervious surfaces uh, on your property, you're generating 600 gallons of rain uh, in a one inch rainstorm. Um, you can see a couple of the other examples in there. Um, it's quite uh, in it's interesting and it's um, alarming that we develop so much stormwater, um, but it's something to keep in mind. Uh, so if you want to take your total impervious uh, surfaces, which includes again your roofs, driveways, sidewalks, et cetera. Um, multiply that by 0.6 and then by the number of inches in a rainstorm 
that'll get you how many uh, gallons of water is coming off. Uh, if you don't want to go outside and measure it directly, you can also go on like Google Maps or just basic satellite imagery, um, and they do a pretty good job at estimating um, how much, or at least an area, if you choose. Um, so you can figure that out pretty easily without going outside and measuring everything. So NPS pollution, this is a little lesser known. Um, and NPS just stands for non-point source pollution. And it's a pollution that comes from a large area somewhere within the watershed, um, but we don't know where the source is. So more times than not caused by stormwater runoff, um, the stormwater will pick up a pollutant and introduce it into our stream and groundwater. Um, it comes from somewhere in the watershed, but again, we don't know what exactly the source is. Um, and the water will pick up, carry away anything that is either natural or human made um, and deposit into lakes, rivers, uh, wetlands, or even into our groundwater. Um, so if you look at that bottom left photo, an example could be fertilizers and pesticides we use on farmland, um, motor oil if you change your oil at home, uh, just basic litter, uh, sediment is a really big one here in Pennsylvania, nor soap, um, unused medication, um, bacteria can get in there, um, or even road salt. Salt's a growing issue here in Pennsylvania and we're, and we're getting more salty uh, streams, which is not very good for the fish that like to live in their freshwater streams. So, of course, not only are we concerned about fish when there's pollutants in there, um, but we're also concerned about our drinking water supplies. Um, it costs a lot more money to uh, treat water that has some sort of pollutant in it, whether it's natural or man-made, uh, versus if we were to keep our streams clean uh, in the first place. The image on the right is an example of a point source pollution. So that means that you basically know exactly where it's coming from. You can see it. Um, not all factories are bad, um, but every once in a while you might see something like that, where they're dumping directly into a stream and that water doesn't look very clean to me. Um, it's a little more rare than the non point source pollution, um, which is a good thing. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of non point source pollutions out there in the watershed um, that we're unaware of. So um, it's kind of a good idea to keep both of those in mind. And in general, just try to reduce as many pollutants as we can. And again, some more examples of pollutants um, are listed here. Um, I mentioned litter, fertilizers, herbicides, um, any type of oil or toxic chemical. I mentioned salt from roads um, in winter conditions. Uh, we get a lot of salt in our water. Um, pharmaceuticals, if you don't um, need a medication anymore, um, there are take back boxes locally around here. Um, we even have them listed on our website. So um, actually it's very, very difficult and almost impossible in some cases to filter out um, certain pharmaceuticals from the water supply. Um, so unfortunately, in some cases, that can um, be in your water supply and you don't know it because it is um, dissolved in there. Uh, bacteria and nutrients from livestock or pet waste or faulty septic systems is another one um, that, of course, is a big concern. Um, acid rain that comes from fossil fuel emissions or um, even acid mine drainage that you might find out in um, the Catawissa Creek watershed. They have a lot of um, acid mine drainage that's going up there from the abandoned mines um, from back in the day. And of course, uh, there's always sediment um, from erosion along our um, crop, our crop fields and our uh, stream banks. Um, a good thing to note is that sediment is actually Pennsylvania's number one pollutant. Um, so we don't know where, you know, the erosion happened necessarily, but we do know that there is sediment in the stream. Um, and if you look at a lot of our streams, of course, there is a lot of erosion occurring. Um, there's a ton of things you can do to help stabilize those streams and reduce erosion. Um, again, if you guys have an issue like that, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, that's what I like to do. I like to try to prevent sediment from getting into our streams. And of course, um, not only for ourselves, but also, you know, that all affects habitats and wildlife. Um, so it's not just thinking about ourselves, but again, we all live downstream. Um, even the plants and animals live downstream from us. So uh, trying to keep our water quality safe and healthy is a uh, top priority for us. So how can we reduce some of those uh, pollution um, that might get in there from stormwater runoff? Uh, we could use a rain barrel, right? It's just one simple, um, easy, pretty inexpensive way that we can collect water and prevent it from uh, flowing into our streams. 
and we can actually harvest it and use it in positive ways um, in our own backyard. Other things you can do, uh, you could build a rain garden. Uh, you can set up some no mown zones or riparian buffers, which are basically just you can uh, line the streams with a bunch of trees and shrubs um, that you can strategically choose and uh, really reduce erosion and it also helps filter out those pollutants. So there's a bunch of other things you can do besides just rain barrels. Um, we do have some resources on, on our website for that. Um, and if you guys are interested in uh, hearing any webinars on those topics, we can also do those as well. Please let us know. So what is a rain barrel? Pretty simple. Rain barrels, uh, they capture water from your roof. Um, it goes down your downspout and you hold that water for a later time um, to use. So you can use it in your garden, uh, you can use it on your lawn, you can use it in indoor plants. Um, you, there's a lot of ways you can use this rainwater in a more uh, positive way. So it reduces the amount of water that flows from your property ultimately. So that is the goal. And again, it's, it's fairly inexpensive and it's pretty simple and eco friendly. So. Uh, it's a good way to start if you're thinking about trying to be a little more sustainable on your property. This is an excellent way to start off uh, giving that a try. So just a couple of benefits and uses, of course, you know, we keep going over, we can reduce our stormwater runoff. Um, you know, just imagine if everyone in a community had a rain barrel um, or some capacity to hold water. Um, we could really reduce a lot of streams uh, from overflowing, um, getting pollutants in there. Um, so. They make a big impact when it comes to reducing stormwater, even though on your property it might seem like it's not that much water, but collectively we can do a whole lot of collection. Um, and it saves, it saves yourself and people downstream from uh, any of the harmful effects that stormwater runoff can produce. You can also water your plants with it. Um, unlike tap water, rainwater is actually pretty nutrient dense. There's actually beneficial uh, bacteria and microorganisms um, that are in rainwater. Um, it's really interesting. You know, rainwater is not just uh, pure water, it's, it's got some good stuff in it. Uh, so the plants love that. Um, I do not recommend you personally drinking uh, any of your rainwater, but your plants will uh, love it. It'll be a lot more nutritious for them. Um, and this image here is actually pretty similar to what our rain barrels are going to look like that we're going to be distributing. A pretty simple system, but you can see um, you don't have to be too close, uh, you get a, a good supply of water to rain your to uh, irrigate your uh, garden and, and your lawn. So um, it comes in handy for sure. And you can save money as well. You know, instead of using your your uh, well and using your uh, hose at home in your backyard, you know, this is just free water. It's gravity fed, so you're not using any energy to use it up. Um, and actually, about 30% of our water bills are spent outdoors. So you can really reduce some of your water bills and your household usage of water uh, by collecting it through rain barrels. And you'll also be protecting, you know, surface and groundwater supplies. Um, basically, by eliminating the process of, of uh, collecting rainwater and having it run off into the street and into your stream, uh, we're going to be collecting it locally and using it in a more positive way. So instead of picking up any pollution, uh, sources that we have on our property, they'll go right in the rain barrel, stay clean, and be able to be used um, pretty, for, for a good purpose. So how do rain barrels work? Um, they are pretty simple systems. So basically rainwater from your roof is collected uh, by the gutters and it's directed towards your downspout. Um, when you get your rain barrel, um, you install your rain barrel, you just connect your downspout to the top of the barrel. And you can see in that image there. Um, the barrel has a removable grate, so it'll capture any leaves or critters that might be trying to enter that. Um, if you have any space between your downspout and the hole there, um, you will want to just check that after each rainstorm, just to make sure it's not getting clogged with leaves. Um, if you have any concerns about mosquitoes, um, you can wrap that with a mesh or stalk. Um, some fine material that allows the water to infiltrate through so the mosquitoes can't get in there. Um, I will talk about mosquitoes more in depth a little bit later. Um, so that's not the only solution to dealing with mosquitoes, but it certainly is one if, it, if it's the largest concern for you. Um, after each rainstorm, your barrel is going to fill with water, of course, and then you can use it for um, later use. 
Um, something very key is to make sure that your spigot is shut when you're not using your rain barrel. Uh, otherwise, that would just flow right out of the rain barrel and you wouldn't be able to harvest it and use it for later. Um, that's quite important to keep in mind. Um, but once your rain barrel fills after a rainstorm, um, simply uh, just attach a hose down to the spigot, um, or you can fill up um, a little, oh, I forget the name of it. You can fill up one of your uh, little containers to uh, do some indoor watering with your plants at home. Um, and if for some reason you have a really big rainstorm, if you're not able to use all the water, there's also going to be an overflow spout up at the top. We can also attach a hose ahead of time, um, or you can catch other rain barrels um, so that if you have an overflow, you can direct it into an area, you know, such as a garden or a rain garden so that that can collect the water. Um, and again, you can also connect another rain barrel so that you can have more capacity to, to fill your rain barrel up and, and collect more water. So I actually have a demo video. Um, I'm hoping that you guys will be able to hear the audio. Um, so I'm going to turn this on. And it's about a three-minute clip, but it gives a very good overview about um, rain barrels, how they work, and also, you know, what, what they'll look like and what our construction uh, design is like. Water conservation is an important part of living green, and a great way to conserve is by harvesting rainwater for your landscape use. Now you can buy a professional system, but they're rather expensive, and here's a way to make one for about $50. I started with a nice green trash can that blends in well with the landscaping, then I drilled a hole in the bottom for a hose bin. And on top, I cut a slightly larger hole for this drainage grate, which helps filter out debris. Then I used a couple of cable ties to hold the lid on securely and set the barrel on a couple of concrete block. Now up at top, you see I've got the downspout that now runs down from the roof to a couple of elbows and right into the barrel. So as this rain barrel fills up with water, you can control it down here at the spigot and you can attach a garden hose and drain it down to a low area. And what I prefer to do is take a soaker hose, attach it to the spigot, then run it through your shrubs and along your flower beds and it will slowly and really gently water the soil. And the really great part about this system is the water is totally free. All right, so hopefully you guys were able to hear that. Um, just a really great overview about, you know, how to use a rain barrel. I think it's a very good summary. Um, so when you guys decide to create a rain barrel or if you purchase a rain barrel, um, this is pretty much all that you'll need. It's pretty simple to put one together. Um, if it is highlighted in, in bold there, um, those will be products you would have to uh, purchase and, and find on your own to install the rain barrel, but if it's not bold, um, that was provided for you um, when you purchased the rain barrel, if you did. Um, so you don't have to worry about that, but if you guys are interested in making more rain barrels and making your own rain barrel, um, this is the list of materials that you will need, um, and I'll have this available um, elsewhere for the instructions and the materials that you would need to create a rain barrel, but pretty simple. Um, not too much, you just kind of need a couple of, uh, you'll just need a spigot, um, an overflow valve, and then you'll also need a hole saw to drill a big enough hole to get your downspout in the barrel. Um, other than attaching hoses, it's pretty simple. Um, so it's pretty simple. It costs about $50 to create um, a ring barrel on your own. So really, really inexpensive. So if you're interested in what kind of barrel to use, um, there are so many different options. Um, honestly, you can use any barrel that, you know, doesn't have a crack or something in it that you know will store water. Now, you can use metal, plastic, or wooden barrels, um, and it also doesn't really matter which size. So we offer 35-gallon rain barrels, you can get a 50-gallon, 100-gallon. Um, there's uh, so many different sizes of containers out there, um, and you can just see a couple of examples here. Um, just something to keep in mind, you'll definitely want to make sure that at least the rain barrels um, don't have any chemicals uh, from it. Um, if you do get a barrel like the one in the top right um, from a local you know, food place or something, you'll just want to make sure that it's food grade, um, that there's no oils or greases or anything in there. Because again, 
um, that one actually would be a type of um, NPS pollutant. And of course, you don't want to collect rainwater that you think is clean and put it in a container that's not clean. Um, that would kind of defeat the purpose. But there's there's so many different um, options of containers that you can use. Um, the simplest one to find is one of those Rubbermaid Group uh, trash cans. Um, and that's actually what we use um, with our designs as well. So just getting started here, um, there are going to be three holes that you're going to want to drill in your barrel once you get it. Um, and something I think I forgot to mention was that you want to make sure your barrel comes with a lid. Um, that will be key to producing or, or reducing uh, mosquitoes from getting into your rain barrel or any other critters you don't want um, to get into there, which can be an issue. Um, so basically, you would actually, um, when you can see on the top on the lid, you're going to create about a four inch hole. You can get a hole saw and drill that there. Um, and that will connect to your downset. Um, the letter B is going to be your overflow. So you want to drill a hole there for your overflow valve. And then down at the bottom, um, you're going to have C, which of course is where your spigot is going to go. This part um, has already been done for you if you purchase one of our rain barrels. Um, so no need to go out and buy a whole saw or anything like that. Uh, we have those for you um, already done. So the next part, of course, after you drill all of your holes, you're going to want to insert um, your overflow adapter, which would be up in D. Um, and then you'll want to insert your hose bib or spigot, which is down in E. Um, you'll want to make sure that this is a tight seal. Um, so I recommend getting um, a thread sealant, um, just, a, just a basic tape that you can wrap around the thread of the spigot or the overflow adapter. And basically, you just push the, uh, the, the spigot or the adapter into the hole until you get a tight seal. If you're having trouble with making it very tight, you can also use silicone to prevent any additional leakages that may happen. So pretty simple to do. Um, after you have your spigot and your overflow adapter attached, um, there is something called an atrium grate. It's a four inch. Um, basically, it's a it's a grate that pre prevents all of that leaf litter um, or any critters from getting into your uh, rain barrel. So you'll just simply add that um, to the top within the four inch hole. Um, if you're having uh, issues with overflow, you can attach a hose to the overflow adapter. Just leave it on there at all times, um, and you can run your hose into, you know, a shrubby area or into a rain garden, um, into your vegetable garden. Um, there's different types of hoses that you can use. It doesn't have to be just one that uh, you use and, and uh, spray everywhere. You can also have one of those drip line hoses so that over time it, it irrigates. Um, but you uh, can basically just, as you set up your rain barrel, you can attach a hose um, so that it can overflow. Uh, safely and not overflow somewhere you don't want it to go. Um, and again, you can or cannot attach a hose to the spigot. You'll just want to make sure that spigot is closed. As long as it's closed, you'll be collecting water. Um, so you'll be doing that down in H. And another key uh, part that you'll want to keep in mind is that this is all gravity set. So you're going to want to put your rain barrel in an area that's a slightly higher elevation to you know, your garden or place that you're planning on uh, using your water. Um, but just simple cinder blocks, just to elevate the barrel um, is really all that you need. Um, so you want to place your barrel on top of the cinder block. Um, and make sure that it's sturdy and supported. Of course, you don't want your rain barrel uh, falling over and spilling. So how many rain barrels would you need? Uh, again, you guys don't need to do uh, the math quite right now. Um, but it's the basic same uh, mathematical equation that we did earlier, figuring out how many of gallons um, of water from a one-inch rainstorm or, or whatever um, you're trying to uh, look at, uh, how many gallons that you're producing and how many gallons of barrels that you would need to collect all that water. Um, so just an example, that 1,000 square foot example um, that you have a quarter inch rainstorm, um, you would produce 150 gallons of rainwater. So if you have a 50 gallon barrel, that means you would have to install three barrels. And again, that overflow valve, um, you can attach a hose to the overflow valve and bring that hose over to 
um, a nearby rain barrel, and that's how you can attach your uh, multiple rain barrels together. So if you needed three rain barrels, it's pretty simple to attach them. So that's pretty much uh, that pretty much covers uh, how to construct a rain barrel. Again, they're, they're pretty simple um, and pretty easy to install. Um, but the biggest part is just going to be how to how to use them over time. So uh, we know how to use them. You just attach a hose, and you can go and water your plants. But we'll also need to maintain these things. So we we'll want to um, increase our storage capacity again uh, by uh, attaching multiple rain barrels to each other. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I also talked about the atrium grate. So you want to check that every once in a while um, to make sure that no leaf litter is clogging um, so that you're not, you know, overflowing some water and that it's getting into the rain barrel. And you also want to empty your barrel within one week of a rainstorm, um, specifically because you want to prevent those mosquitoes from breeding and uh, making their little mosquito babies. Um, basically, mosquitoes, once they lay their eggs, it takes about five to seven days uh, for those mosquitoes to hatch. So that being said, after a rainstorm, as long as you use your water or drain it into an area uh, within five to seven days, you should be able to prevent uh, successfully any mosquitoes from breeding um, and becoming adults from your rain barrel. And also algae growth. Um, you'll want to stir that up just so that we don't get algae growth. Um, algae can or cannot be good for your plants depending on uh, your plant's needs. So just prevent that in the first place by uh, emptying your barrel within one week of a rainstorm. You also want to check um, maybe once or twice a year, just go out, check your rain barrel, see if there's any cracks or leaks. Um, that would probably be most, uh, you'll want to do that after the winter time from all the freeze thaw that would be going on. So you just want to make sure there's no leaks going on um, so that you're capturing all the water that you possibly can. Um, you'll also want to leave your overflow valve open at all times. Um, that way, nothing's you know rising to the top of the lid um, and, and going back up that drain spout or, or uh, scaling over where you don't want it to. Uh, and also during the winter time, you want to leave all of your valves open. Again, you don't want to collect water and have a bunch of water freeze in your ring barrel because um, that would cause a lot of cracks and leakages down the road. Um, so during the winter, keep your spigot open. During the summer, keep your spigot closed. Um, you should be good there. I have a question here. Um, it looks like, do you have to drain below the spigot when you drain after a rainfall? Um, yes, I would say that you would have to drain below the spigot. Um, you'll, again, you'll want to raise your rain barrel as best you can because um, it will be gravity fed. Um, so definitely try to raise it as much as you can. If it is filled with water, um, at least half or more, um, I would assume that the pressure of the water would also help um, that come out as well. So gravity and pressure are really going to be driving your uh, rain barrel. Um, some other uh, maintenance tips is just uh, detaching your downspout. Um, again, from filling and freezing in the winter time, um, that freeze thaw can really do a lot of damage for uh, rain barrels. So just something to keep in mind when it's winter time, just kind of take your take your uh, rain barrel out of commission for the time being. Um, and every year you want to wash your rain barrel. Um, again, just to make sure that you're not harvesting any, you know, algae growth or uh, bacteria or anything that we don't want our plants to be drinking up. So something as simple as doing a mixture of vinegar and water, um, just scrub a rain barrel and uh, make sure that's cleaned up. Just once a year is all you really need. You can also uh, decorate your rain barrel. Um, here's an example of a really nice looking one. Um, I'm going to have a, a little more information on how to decorate your rain barrel later on, um, but that's definitely another way to make your rain barrel look really nice in the landscape and not just have uh, some plain color in there. Uh, whatever you're looking for, any option uh, is certainly acceptable. So mosquitoes. Um, luckily, I actually used to be a mosquito technician. Um, I used to work for the Northumberland County Conservation District, and my job was to go find mosquitoes and, and kill them. Um, so I know a lot about mosquitoes, probably more than I ever thought I would. Um, but again, they, they breed in stagnant organic water. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, if you empty your rain barrel um, within five to seven days after a rainstorm, um, they're not going to be able to breathe. Um, and you can see the photos of them. These guys, they breathe water, so they stay very close to the top of the surface. You'll see them 
uh, kind of squirming around and kind of not uh, not hard to miss. Um, so if you see these little guys twisting around, wiggling, um, they're mosquitoes. Um, all you have to do is just uh, go in and drain your rain barrel if you're seeing them so that they won't hatch. Another thing you can do, you can actually add a quarter cup of uh, vegetable oil or like a coconut oil or something um, that's biodegradable, you know, that your, your plants would enjoy. Um, but that creates a film at the top of your rain barrel, um, and it makes it a lot more difficult for those little mosquito larvae to hatch. And also, you want to make sure that the top hole um, is covered um, if your downspout is not perfectly sealed. Um, again, you can uh, put a, a mesh on there or a sock. You can wrap the atrium grate with a sock. Um, just kind of be a little creative with that if, if you have um, concerns about mosquitoes. Again, the best way to, to prevent mosquitoes in general is just to get rid of that standing water um, and drain that within five to seven days. Um, something else to keep in mind, you know, just looking at that image at the top, um, there are potential areas for mosquitoes throughout um, your backyard, um, anywhere that pools water and potentially um, becomes organic. And that just means um, if you get uh, leaf litter or something like that that kind of sits in the water over time, that's a lot of nutrients. Um, and it becomes stinky over time, which attracts the mosquitoes. So, you know, you might want to go out if you have any tires or like toys or a bird bath, you know, drain those every once in a while too. Even your gutters is a big one. Um, that'll produce mosquitoes as well. So just kind of a general um, maintenance. It's not just the rain barrels that produce mosquitoes. It's, there's a lot of other factors that can also um, go in with that. You can paint and decorate your rain barrel. Um, there are lots of different options. You can get very creative. Um, you can see there someone painted it to look like an actual wooden barrel. Um, you can make it look like a can of soup or, or put any landscape or, or really anything that you want on there. Um, put your last name or, or something family related in there. Um, have your kids do some fingerprint or whatever they want to uh, do with some finger paint. Um, and I will put the instructions up for how to paint your rain barrel. So you can do like a solid color if you want, um, but you can also go in and color and, and draw and, and really decorate the rain barrel. So um, there's lots of different options that you can do. Um, and I, again, will have that as a resource that you guys can download um, so you can see specific instructions about how to paint your rain barrel, what types of paints to use and whatnot. So just some other recommendations. Um, you know, we just talked about rain barrels, but there are so many other things that you can do in, the, in your backyard to reduce pollution, uh, reduce stormwater, and just in general, um, kind of protect the environment and, and be a better steward to the environment. Um, of course, we all talk about, you know, don't be a litter bug. That's, that's pretty big. Um, we want to recycle. Uh, we do have some good recycling programs around here, but, you know, trying to make sure that you recycle as best as you can um, and not even recycle, but reduce and reuse products. Um, that would be huge as well. Uh, limiting the use of pesticides and fertilizers. Um, if you're fertilizing your, your lawn every year, uh, there are other methods that you can do to fertilize your yard that are actually organic and save you some time and money. Um, and it also saves our streams um, and helps improve their water quality. Um, I mentioned uh, rain gardens. They are essentially an engineered garden um, designed to collect water and infiltrate it into the soil. Um, lots of resources are available out there if you're interested in getting a rain garden. Um, and again, it's another topic we could also talk about on the webinar if you guys are interested. Um, you can compost your own waste. Um, that's another big way to kind of reduce some things going out uh, even into landfills. Because uh, again, landfills also uh, leach water. So that can also go into the water supply. Um, disposing again of, of any oils or paints or household chemicals. Um, I also mentioned uh, Unused prescriptions, if, you know, properly disposing of, of uh, chemicals would also greatly reduce pollution in our waterways. Um, if you're interested in controlling soil erosion, which is, again, Pennsylvania's biggest uh, issue for water quality, um, planting native ground covers, trees, and shrubs is huge, especially along the stream bank. Um, we have a number of uh, options here at the Conservation District to get you guys trees. We have an annual plant sale. Um, unfortunately, we had to cancel this year, but we do offer it every year. Um, so that's an option to go in and plant some good trees and shrubs and, and covers to reduce erosion and even 
uh, build habitat um, for all of our good wildlife that we want to keep around. Um, and also, you know, not going up to the edge of a stream, pond, or ditch. Um, that's another big one. You know, leaving a buffer really helps filter out that stormwater. Um, and having your septic system in, uh, inspected uh, every three to five years, that will really help us uh, reduce any nutrients getting into the uh, water supply that we don't want, uh, especially from septic systems. Um, just using earth friendly products around your yard, uh, managing pests and animal waste. I mentioned uh, using uh, unused medications and, and disposing them properly at a local take back uh, center. Um, and also, you know, if you're a local farmer around here, um, you can plant cover crops or use no till conservation practices. Um, that really helps reduce, sorry, that really helps reduce a, a whole bunch of erosion and, and issues with uh, fertilizer and manure runoff. Um, so, of course, we over here at the Conservation District have a ton of resources that we can work with local farmers um, to implement those types of practices. Um, I also cannot stress enough the importance of protecting our floodplains and our wetlands. Um, it is amazing how much water that they can store um, throughout the landscape. Um, you can very significantly reduce amount, the amount of stormwater and the amount of flash floods that we have if we protect our um, remaining wetlands and floodplains and also try to do some more smart, smarter uh, land development in our communities and encouraging forest cover. Um, so that is a whole bunch of stuff, uh, just a really brief run through, um, but there are so many other things that we can do to also prevent um, NPS pollution um, and among other issues within our uh, watersheds and our communities. Um, and again, rain barrels are probably one of the greatest places to start off with. So for those of you that um, did purchase a rain barrel, um, we're going to follow up with an email once we know uh, the date of distribution. So we're, we're still unsure about that. Uh, we don't want to set anything in stone quite yet, um, but your barrels will uh, be available hopefully sometime this summer. Um, you'll come over to the Conservation District office and pick them up. Um, they will have the holes are already going to be pre-drilled. Um, we have the spigots and the overflow valves um, and the grates for you. Um, really, all you're going to need to do is to install your rain barrel connected to your downspout and then attach some hoses to it. Um, so if anyone has any additional questions, feel free to um, give me an email or, or call the Conservation District office. Um, but again, we will send you guys an email um, letting you know when and, and where, how we can arrange um, getting that rain barrel to you in the future. Um, you guys probably don't have... Uh, the opportunity to do this quite yet, but when we do get the rain barrel to you, we would love to see it uh, installed. Um, or even if you can't wait, if you just go and create your own rain barrel, um, you know, during this quarantine time, it's a great time to learn a new skill. Um, so if you guys do install a new rain barrel or, or really any other conservation practice that I mentioned today, um, I would love to see it. Um, we will uh, definitely feature you uh, on our Facebook and also on our website. Um, just to kind of show off some of the stuff that we're doing in the, in the landscape and, and in our communities um, and, and also help further educate other people um, that may not have attended this webinar about, you know, what is a rain barrel, how can they do it, and, you know, how can they create their own um, or even paint their own, you know. Um, we would love to, to see that. If you guys do get one installed, please, please send us a photo. Um, and also, please watch for an email next week, uh, hopefully in the beginning of the week, and then send out an email, um, and it's going to have a brief survey. Now, I mentioned that the webinar and the rain girls were funded through DEP and their Environmental Education Grant Program. Um, so they require us to collect a survey um, to get everyone's feedback, and it also helps us qualify for future environmental grants um, to do things just like this. Um, if you enter the webinar from our website, um, and if I don't have your email, um, please feel free to, you know, put your email in the chat box, or you can even just email me directly. Um, I'll add you to the list so that you can uh, get the resources in the PowerPoint and the, sur uh, the survey. Um, so I'm going to have those available on the website, and hopefully this uh, webinar will also be recorded um, and uploaded by then as well. So uh, be sure to look for that uh, early next week, um, so you can kind of. Uh, review all of the notes all over again and, and get all the information that you need. So that being said, 
Uh, again, uh, there's my contact information. Uh, you feel free to call me or email me anytime if you have any questions or concerns. Um, and the Conservation District is always available to help um, through any of our programs. So, so please give us um, an email. Um, I have our secretary uh, email down there, Tracy Um She uh, would be able to answer any questions if you have questions about uh, the rain barrel purchases that some of you made. Um, so I encourage you to reach out to her if you have any questions regarding like your payment or something like that. And again, I, I do encourage everyone to check out the coalition's website. Uh, consider joining one of our, our meetings or one of our events uh, that we have in the future. Uh, we, we'd love to see you. We'd love to get some more people uh, involved out here uh, thinking about water quality and, and all of the issues that are kind of growing and, and becoming bigger and bigger concerns uh, within our watersheds. And we, we definitely want to keep our water quality clean, um, not just for us and drinking or wildlife, but it's a great, you know, recreation. You know, I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I love to go out and, and kayak or, or and just enjoy our stream. Um, so I want to I want to see that continue here, and I think that we all I think we all do. Um, again, Pennsylvania is a water state, um, so we, we're really tied into water, and we love our water. So um, anything that you guys can do to, to come out and help, um, come on, join the coalition, and uh, we'd love to see you and hear from you and get some good work done here. And also, don't forget those watershed organizations. You guys can check out um, on our website. So at this time, I'm going to open it up for questions. Um, if you guys have any questions, just find that chat box, um, and I'm just going to sit here uh, and, and answer your questions. Um, feel free to email me if, if you have um, a more personal question or something um, that might be a little more in-depth. Give me, a, give me a call or an email at some point, um, and hopefully we can uh, help you out there. So Chantel here, uh, she's actually my uh, counterpart over at Columbia, or at Northumberland County. Um, something that she wanted to add there was about mosquito collection is you can uh, add mosquito dump to your rain barrel, which is true. You can um, you can go purchase them at your local um, Agway or Renko. Or you can go on Amazon. There's a bunch of places that sell mosquito dump. Um, they're basically um, bacteria. Um, that are oftentimes, at least when, when we were both uh, mosquito technicians, um, they were covered in like a, like a corn grain. And it's a bacteria that when the mosquitoes consume it, um, they actually start multiplying and the mosquitoes' stomachs um, explode. So the little larvae die, um, but um, only the mosquitoes consume those. So any other aquatic organisms living in there don't eat this uh, product. So it, it's actually safe for wildlife and other insects and animals. Um, and it doesn't harm people at all, it just kills mosquitoes. So there, that is another option if you're concerned about mosquitoes, that you can go out and purchase those mosquito dumps. Um, it's literally pretty much it's just a pellet that you throw in the rain barrel um, and it'll do its job. Um, someone asked, Becky asked um, if we do well water testing. Um, we do not at this moment. Uh, however, we are actually actively thinking about and considering um, finding a grant in the future and trying to get, um, you know, an educational webinar or something like that where we can uh, talk about well water, how to keep that clean. And then we also are we're interested in setting up an event where you can drop off some of your water and we can test it for water quality. Um, so definitely uh, be on the lookout for that. That is something we are we are actually considering. Um, but I highly encourage everyone, you know, even at least a year to just test your water. Um, there's a lot of different factors. The groundwater supply is always changing um, with what's in there. Um, and again, we're all downstream from someone else. So what your neighbors do upstream from you may be affecting you. Um, so definitely, I do encourage, you know, don't just wait for that, but uh, try to test your water at least on an annual basis to see if it is clean. Um, and you can do that at Penn State Extension. They are actually over um, on Sawmill Road, where the conservation district is. They're at the bottom level of the um, building, and they will have water testing kits that you guys can use. You just collect water and send it to Penn State, and then they will um, email you the results and let you know what's in your water. Um, highly recommend that. That would be, that would be a great idea. So 
if you guys have any other questions, feel free to just type that in the chat box. Ah, so someone asked the average amount of rainfall per storm to figure out capacity. Um, annually, interestingly, it's actually um, about 40 inches. But of course, as we consider seasons, it's going to change throughout the season. So, um, for example, spring time right now, just like on a day uh, today, you're going to get more rain than you would see uh, typically in the middle of the summer when things dry up a little bit. Um, on average, I would say it would be about a quarter inch to a half inch around here. Now that being said, um, of course, both counties have seen, well, actually just across the state, we've seen a ton more water on average than in the past. So maybe take that with a grain of salt. Um, I would encourage you all to just shoot for at least a half inch rainstorm. Um, if you have a capacity for a one inch rainstorm, that, that could also um, be even more beneficial. But um, I would say at a minimum, just consider a quarter inch to a half inch rainstorm would be about average for here in Columbia County. Um, Danny asked if there's more rain barrel kits available to purchase. At this time, there are not. Um, I've had a number of questions um, similar to that uh, about people asking, you know, if there's rain barrel kits available. Uh, if, if more of you guys are interested in a webinar like this and receiving rain barrels, uh, again, this is funded through a grant, but we are more than happy to apply for grants in the future uh, to, to get these rain barrels uh, to you guys. So um, if you guys are interested in a rain barrel, um, please give me an email. Just give me some feedback, even on that survey. Let me know you're interested. Um, and if there's enough interest, we'll definitely get working on trying to get a, a grant to do some more of these types of things. Awesome. I'm glad to see everyone's excited to get their rain barrel set up and glad everyone got to learn something new. That's great. Uh, Susan asked if there's a, she has a drainage run through their subdivision that erodes during heavy rainfall and if we can help. Um, absolutely. Uh, the conservation district is definitely here to help um, deal with any stormwater issues. Uh, we are focused primarily on water quality. so. Um, there, there are a number of things that we can do to help you guys out. If I'm unable to help you, uh, we also have our erosion and sedimentation uh, technician, Barry Travelty. Uh, he can also come out and help you. And, and if there's nothing we can do, we'll get you in touch with another agency that might have some better resources as well. Um, so just definitely, you know, when in doubt, give us a call. Um, we'll, we'll be honest with you and tell you if we can help you or not. And then we're also always very diligent. We're keeping out eyes out for other grants and opportunities between agencies to make sure that you guys, you know, get the resources that you do need in the future. So yeah, if you have any drainage issues, just give me a call. I'd love to come uh, check them out and give you, give you as much advice as I can um, and hopefully direct you in the right direction there. Uh, again, rain barrel kits in the future. Uh, hopefully we can, if you guys have enough interest, we can, we can certainly uh, start applying for some more grants if we can get those available again. Uh, Stacy asked me if there's any restrictions that you know of with local municipalities as far as having a rain collection barrel in town. Um, I am unaware if there are any restrictions about rain barrel collection. Um, definitely check in with your local municipalities ordinances. Um, that is a great question. That's a good concern. They may be concerned about like mosquitoes. And again, it, a lot of ordinances are just a matter of, of education. Um, some of them could definitely be updated. So there are, there are certainly uh, conservation practices throughout the community that um, would be very useful that the ordinances do not allow for. Um, so again, yeah, something like that is something you would want to check in with your uh, local municipality. And if there is a restriction, by all means, um, you know, tell them what you learned today or even just send them my way. I'd love to talk to them and, and maybe we can reverse some of those restrictions so we can uh, help improve our water quality around here.
any other questions out there, even just comments or general questions uh, not related to rain barrels, um, or if there's a subject you guys are interested in uh, listening to an, another webinar on, um, I'm happy to do some more webinars if you guys are interested. But by, by all means, this was this was pretty fun. I'm happy you guys were able to get in here and learn something new. Uh, so let us know what what topics you guys do want to hear in the future. Uh, Justin John asked, I know it's not safe for us to drink the water, but how about horses or livestock? Um, you know, that's a great question. I, I know plants will be pretty happy with it, um, but horses and livestock, they do have nutritional needs um, and they're all different. Um, so I would I would actually reach out to maybe a local 4-H um, or Penn State Extension. They have a lot more information regarding um, livestock nutritional needs and, and if uh, harvesting rainwater would be good or not. Um, I would make the assumption that it would be good uh, just because of, you know, the troughs out there are probably also collecting rainwater. Um, but don't don't quote me on that. Definitely uh, do a little more research. Uh, Penn State Extension would be a great uh, resource to reach out to on that one. Okay, Susan would love to see one on a rain garden. We can definitely do some rain garden uh, webinars. There's a ton of information out there on what, uh, rain gardens and Frankly, they do uh, a, almost an even better job than rain barrels at collecting stormwater. So uh, that's certainly something we can do. I, I really appreciate all the great feedback. This is great. Um, like I said, I'd love to do some more of these. Any any uh, topics you'd like, uh, we, I can do one even on streams. Um, I know flooding is a concern around here. Um, you're welcome, Danny. Yeah, we definitely didn't want to cancel this one. Uh, spent a lot of time on it, and, and I think it's some great information to get out there. So I appreciate you guys joining us. So yeah, if you guys want to see any uh, webinars in the future, any topics, even you know native plants and trees and just anything like that, I'm, I'm happy to give you some more information. Or if you have any general questions, um, by all means, give me a call. I love I love talking about the environment. I'm I'm, a, I'm nerdy in that way, so I mean, any chance to talk about the environment, I'm happy. All uh, right, Jean says she has a lot of rocks in her yard. Is there a way to utilize them for water drainage? Um, that may or may not be a possibility, uh, depending on you know where the rocks are located. I know a lot of people um, sometimes will use rocks um, almost as a form of like a rain garden, where they kind of uh, collect water and use it as a drainage system um, to like put it in in an area that better infiltrates the water. Um, so it's something you can definitely take a look at and get creative with, um, or even you know if you have a paved driveway, you know use utilizing rocks as gravel instead of a paved driveway that'll definitely infiltrate more water um, into your property. Because um, of course, you know, a paved driveway would just uh, create more stormwater, whereas if you had a gravel driveway, um, you would definitely get infiltrating more water and it would be uh, less runoff coming from your property. So definitely a possibility, yeah. Uh, if anyone's familiar with Black Creek, if fish can survive in it, um, looks like there might be some sulfur in there. I'm not too familiar with Black Creek. It doesn't sound too pretty, um, but if it's something local, um, Montour or Columbia County, I, I'd love to come check it out. Um, there's also some resources online and uh, of, of stream designations that the state gives um, to say, you know, if, if aquatic life could survive or not in certain streams. Um, so I can certainly, if you want to reach out to me, I can certainly look that up and, and give you give you a more precise information. Uh, answer on that one, but yeah, if you have a lot of sulfur uh, in your uh, environment, that would that would probably not be pretty good. I, I would be guessing the sulfur is not in high concentration, not very good. Native plants and trees. I can I can certainly do a webinar on those. It's one of my favorite topics. I'm kind of a tree nerd. Um, anything forestry related, I'm happy to talk about. Um, and also, if you guys are interested, I have um, if you go to the workshop tab up at the Conservation District website, um, I used to do some no mow zone presentations and it, and it really talks a lot about kind of the similar subjects that we've been talking about today. 
Um, so if you guys want to check that out, the PowerPoint is on there. You can download it and read some information about um, managing your yard, um, trying to reduce mowing in your yard to collect and, and infiltrate more water, um, and while also creating habitat. So yeah, definitely check that out, but I'd love to do a webinar on that for sure. All right, sounds like everyone's interested in native trees, so uh, definitely I, I'm, I will get on top of that. Oh yeah, if there's a creek that's um, close to anywhere near uh, Catawissa Creek or by a, an old coal mine, uh, it most likely is, is probably being affected by acid mine drainage. Um, acid mine drainage is basically um, when they abandon these coal mines, uh, you still have water that is being infiltrated, you know, from, from the mountain, you know, there's still forest. Uh, it picks up things like pyrite, um, which is very, uh, it's mostly made out of iron. Um, so that's why you see all the rusty orange water out there. Um, that is a big indication of, of acid mine drainage. Um, and you can also get aluminum uh, that will also create acid mine drainage, but it, it will actually be more clear. So the water will look crystal clear, but you won't find any stream or any um, invertebrates or fish swimming around in there. Um, that's, that's another indication of some acid mine drainage. And definitely, it's, it's a big hurdle to try to combat that. Um, but there, there's some great work being done out in Catawissa Creek uh, to help clean those waters up. Any information on introduction of native elms and chestnuts? Um, I have a couple of information. Um, American chestnuts are one of my little fascinations. Um, and very, very recently, actually, they just announced that um, somewhere up in New York, they actually have purebred American chestnuts that appear to be blight resistant. Um, so fingers crossed that they're able to introduce those and get those genes out into the gene pool in the wild, and hopefully we can bring back our American chestnuts. Um, it's, an, it's amazing the resources that those chestnuts um, uh, provide. Um, and, and likewise with elms, I'm not, I'm not too familiar with any uh, efforts to bring back the elm. It seems like um, it seems like there's not too much hope for them, but definitely um, a former native tree that, that really dominated our landscape as well. Um, and it's definitely definitely worth worth looking into on the elms. But as far as the American chestnut, um, the American Chestnut Foundation has great resources out there. Uh, so definitely check them out. And again, I, I'm kind of a nerd about them, so give me a call and I can give you some more information on American chestnuts. And uh, if you join the American Chestnut Foundation, they actually do give out uh, pure American chestnut seeds on an annual basis. Um, so I've actually been talking to them recently. So it sounds like in the fall, they're going to be sending them out. So uh, definitely you're interested in, by all means, uh, check them out as well. But uh, yeah, we could even do a, a webinar just on, uh, you know, native trees that, you know, were affected by blight. Um, I could talk about ash and all the ash trees that are coming out and uh, the hemlocks that are dying. That's definitely a topic that we could discuss as well. We've got about 20 minutes left for the webinar. Um, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I'm happy to stay here. So if you do have any other questions, by all means, uh, send them my way. Thomas asked if there's any uh, possibility to print the slides from the presentation. Absolutely. Um, if I have your email address, I'll be emailing you guys uh, early next week. 
uh, with this presentation. I'm actually going to um, give you an alternate presentation that's actually going to have uh, pretty much all of the notes and, and things that I said today actually on the slide so you can see them. Um, so you'll get some more information. Um, and also, um, I even have a, a better resource for instructions that's a little more comprehensive about uh, doing these rain barrels of construction. So uh, for sure, I'll, I will have those slides available to print. Um, and also, hopefully, we can upload uh, this webinar uh, as a recording up to the website as well. So while I have you guys on here, this was actually my first webinar. Um, you know, let me know in the chat box how was how was the audio, how was the video, um, was everything clear for you guys? Good, good to hear. Thanks, Jean. Oh, thank you, Takesha. Awesome. Good to hear. All right, guys. Well, we have uh, no other questions. I guess we'll end the webinar here. Um, but again, my contact information is up there. Uh, feel free to send me an email if you have any other questions, um, or if you if you want any of us from the district to come out and look at maybe some of your conservation concerns, you know, give us a call at the district office. Um, and again, I, I definitely encourage everyone to, to join their local watershed protection group um, or the Coalition for Source Water Protection. Pruning blueberries. I do not have information on that. Um, however, Penn State Extension downstairs, um, they have a horticulturalist. Um, he's excellent. Um, he definitely will give you a ton of information on pruning blueberries um, or really any fruit trees or, or, or shrubs. Um, he's a really great resource, so definitely reach out to Penn State Extension. And they'll get you in touch with someone locally that can uh, give you some advice on pruning, pruning really any tree or fruit tree. You're welcome. And I, I believe the phone number for Penn State Extension is 570-784-6660. If anyone wants to give them a call, that's their number. Not sure if they're in or not, but hopefully they're checking their voicemail. All right, guys. So uh, sounds like we're uh, all out of questions here. Um, again, feel free to reach out to me, but I really appreciate you all coming on, and uh, hopefully you all learn something new, um, and I encourage all of you guys, please, uh, by all means, tell your friends, family, uh, coworkers what you learned today. Um, you know, the more we can kind of educate the community about, you know, uh, being better stewards for the environment, um, it, it's, it's nothing but benefits. There's, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong about talking about the environment and, and appreciating resources that we have so uh, by all means please please spread the message and encourage them to check out the website once these things are uh, uploaded uh, for them to download and see themselves um, so with that uh, I'm going to end the webinar but I really appreciate everyone for coming out thank you guys <laughs>